Viserys stood atop the wall admiring his kingdom. After he had conjured the storm that had intercepted the Maiden's last voyage back to Westeros, he had ended his own voyage near Hardhome. Jarkin Hagar had failed to return to his flagship, and he assumed him dead. For nearly two weeks, Pyat Pri, Viserys, and a few retainers made their trek deeper into the kingdoms. Viserys and his men utilized the Nightfort tunnel that Brandon Stark had to reveal to him some months prior. From there, they traveled by foot along the top of the wall to Castle Black. Oliven was an impersonator of the Night's Watch and a paid asset of Pyat Pri. Oliven had brought the king topside to meet his fate, that is, until the maiden had interrupted their ritual. Viserys had arrived at the funeral pyre a mere hundred yards from the Castle Black Lift. His confusion was evident as Pyat rushed to him to explain. The smith was to have his blood spilled for use in the Horn of Winter, but his body was not to be burned until the dragon egg was retrieved. Without words, the warlock then pulled the egg from the maiden's purse. Viserys's heart beat even harder within his chest. Pyat was to pay for this mistake with his life. Now Viserys felt a reprieve was in order. Oliven had placed Gendry upon a shallow pyre, his blood trail leading back to Arya's body. Viserys bent down to observe the work of his men. I look forward to facing those who would avenge you, maiden. There was a sense of dismay, perhaps even regret, as Viserys would have enjoyed facing her himself. Still, Pyat was operating as instructed, clearing the way for Viserys to claim his weapons. Viserys bent down for a taste of her blood. He withdrew, feeling disappointed. He reverently lowered her eyelids as a means of respect between foes. Perhaps there could even be an eventual respect between their houses. He returned to the issue at hand back at the funeral pyre. Oliven held the burning torch and was approached by Viserys. He seemed to hold his breath before his grace addressed him directly. You deserve my congratulations and my gratitude, my friend. I would address you by your proper title, but you have never properly introduced yourself. While this is the face you have presented to me, I dare say, you will never be allowed in my presence while wearing any other, are we clear? Oliven, a hired faceless man, bowed his head in acknowledgement of his grace. Viserys then turned his attention back over to Pyat, while he observed the smith upon his funeral pyre. Viserys had not intended on burning the body as of yet, but this situation had now seemed most opportune. Perhaps when the sun sets upon Westeros this night, it again would be filled with the sounds of dragons, Viserys thought. Pyat approached and handed his grace the Horn of Winter. Its reputation and rumors were many, and it had been the subject of search by both gods and men. Its results would be clarified this night and recorded diligently for all time, Viserys thought. He wiped Arya's blood from his mouth and drank deeply from his personal skin to cleanse his palate before testing the smith. Viserys's animalistic instinct took over as he brushed his finger near Gendry's deep neck wound. He raised the king's blood to his lips but thought better of it and took in its scent. His surprise must have been evident, though he tried to contain it. Not all secrets need be revealed immediately. He then introduced the king's blood to his tongue and confirmed his suspicions. He felt excited at the possibilities. His mind temporarily wandered to King Ares and felt a sudden rush of family pride. While there had always been rumors in the more courageous circles, but having these whispers all but confirmed would alter his tactics greatly. Viserys kept his thoughts to himself, though Pyat had seemed quite interested in them. His daughter, the princess, what is her status? Fully under the control of your sworn bannerman, one of your more reliable lords, your grace. Viserys' thoughts temporarily dwelled on the lords firmly sworn unto him. The hot-tempered lord of the Riverlands would have to be replaced, but it appears he had already met his end at the hand of the Lannisters. Viserys then retrieved the horn from his robes and held it high amongst the northern winds. For years he had researched the abilities and the rituals associated with the horn. No clear answers were evident, but numerous suggestions had made their way across his eyes. His commands would pass through the horn, perhaps directly to the old gods themselves. They would pass through the blood of its king before reaching the ears of whatever would be listening in the north, or perhaps beyond.
Viserys grasped Gendry's face and tilted his head towards him. His blood poured from the wound and was collected by the horn. The moment was finally upon him. Nearly two decades of plots and research had led him to this moment. Briefly, all the ill will House Targaryen had suffered over the centuries had passed through his mind. The death of Princess Rhaenys in Dawn, the dance, the rebellions, of Summerhall, the Kingslayer and the abdication. No longer Viserys thought to himself. He drew his deepest breath and sang his commands to the gods. Its tone was deep and low and for the briefest of moments, Viserys doubted whether it even made a sound. He emptied his lungs through the king's blood and sang of his intentions. The wall had begun to moan and creak. The slightest of rumbles appeared from underneath his feet. He lowered the horn from his lips and heard a screech from the distant west. He peered into the grey waste as he heard the screech, again and then again. The longer he peered, the louder they became. The wind came in repetitive gusts as Viserys could hardly contain his excitement. Finally, a massive wingspan came into view, flying high along the wall. Viserys closed his eyes reverently and commanded the pale giant dragon to fly due north. Without a verbal order, the monster then turned north. Again, Viserys ordered a course change, and the beast tucked its wings into a dive. Just before reaching the horizon, he turned south and hovered as Viserys basked in its glory. Pyatt's thin smile showed his approval before he broke the silence thick with satisfaction. Congratulations, Your Grace. How shall you utilize your latest weapon? Viserys was irritated at the question. This was a moment to be revered, not inquired at. Still, the Warlock had nearly raised Viserys from a babe, up until the time Viserys had surpassed the Warlock's abilities. Viserys fashioned the horn to his side. He would never be separated from it again. No matter his state of dress, whether he bathed, loved a woman, or took the head of his enemy, he stared down the man who had acted as a surrogate father before simply responding. East. My ice dragon will head east and secure our army's landing. At these words, the pale monster roared and let out a bolt of intertwined blue and golden flames. It was possibly the most beautiful sight Viserys had ever taken in. Kinvara had finally appeared and offered her silent congratulations. She would be needed for the next ritual, thought Viserys. The ice dragon darted east into the rising sun and out of sight. Kinvara took her place at the head of the pyre, collecting the torch from Olivan. Viserys placed his recovered dragon egg under the arm of the former king of Westeros. The irony of a Targaryen finally avenging the trident, as well as the Baratheon usurping of his birthright. Of course, his cousin, the Abdicator, would still technically be in line considering Viserys was born of a second son of the Mad King. His time will come. Once the realm saw him as the craven he was, a quiet private death would never do. Viserys would be sure Aegon's death would be public, for all to judge, and then to welcome their new king. An inert dragon egg would now be woken. How appropriate it would be that the Targaryen words of fire and blood be the necessary elements to wake the dragon. Viserys nodded, and Kinvara lowered the torch, and the dry tinder of the pyre immediately took to the flame. The pyre was engulfed quickly, despite the stiff breeze that battered the top of the wall. Kinvara cleared her throat and began ululating with the tones Viserys had instructed her to. Viserys ceremoniously discarded his robes onto the snow and took his first step onto the pyre. His offspring, Princess Regan, in her infancy, somehow discovered the ability of the unburnt. Viserys now would do the same. The gods be damned. His boots and trousers radiated the heat to his legs, and Viserys could smell the burning of body hair. Still, Viserys refused to acknowledge the pain. He was confused as to why he was experiencing it. He swallowed the pain and dared to take a second step into the flames and claim his prize. His knees nearly buckled under the pain as his second step slipped on the melting ice. Viserys pivoted to flee from the flames as they had seemingly won the day. Viserys fell to his face into the shallow flames and rolled his way out to safety. 
He breathed heavily as most of his clothing had burned away as well as his pride and dignity. He wailed and whimpered as the roaring flames of the pyre were seemingly mocking his ignorance. His body was nearly hairless, covered in blisters, and his legs were shedding its skin like a snake. Pyat Pri and Kinvara pulled him to a safe distance and the warlock offered him a small vial of milky liquid. Viserys emptied the bottle and the confusion had started to set in. What did he miss? He had watched Daenerys mother her dragons nearly a hundred times. Surely he had at the very least met all the prerogatives to wake this dragon. The only attribute Daenerys bested him was sentiment and emotional weakness. The poppy had eased his suffering but still the flames mocked him. The pyre hissed and toppled over, allowing the egg to roll across the clear, glossy ice that glistened under the heat. Viserys was rage-filled as he stumbled up to his feet, his red priestess and warlock pleading with him at what may have gone wrong. Viserys roared for silence and the two reacted like guilty, scolded children in fear of their abusive father. Still, the warlock felt inclined to speak and explain away his failure to his king. Viserys would hear none of it. He clamped his palms down on the warlock's ears and Pyat then fell to his knees. The rage that filled his stomach rose up and felt it tingle and move down his arms, and then to the flats of his palms. Without warning, the warlock's head burst into flames and Viserys' ears filled with the screams of the dying slender man. Kinvara fell to her knees, pleading for mercy, as Viserys had now finally learned to control the flames in the physical realm. Still, his body was burned, nearly beyond recognition. He would carry the scars of this failure for the rest of his life. Pyat Pri would as well, though his life would be significantly shorter. The charred remains of the warlock then turned to ash and blew into the northern wind. Viserys collapsed from either the toll this task took or the poppy he had ingested. Kinvara rose to her feet and inspected his wounds. He heard Olivan murmur, though his voice was unrecognizable. His last conscious thought was sent to the ice dragon he controlled to ensure that the invasion of Eastwatch was indeed successful.